Okay, we are live. Welcome to today's uh, program. Um, sorry, I have to kind of get these things started like right as I'm going to go live because my computer will kind of act weird if I uh, let it sit there and wait. Uh, so sorry that you have to kind of join it like as soon as it starts. But uh, I, as I said, my name is Patrick Hines. I'm the pastor here at uh, Brittle Heights Presbyterian Church. I have a new desk lamp. Sorry, that's in the way there. <clears throat> and today I wanted to read and walk through uh, Galatians chapter 5 and uh, look at uh, just the first six verses or so, as I think they are an incredibly important uh, passage of Scripture. We actually went over these uh, some last night and had such a good discussion with uh, the folks uh, here from church, just some of the folks here from church that come to our been coming to our Wednesday night Bible study lately, uh, that I wanted to address this some again. And I made reference uh, as we were discussing this to a quotation uh, from Robert Raymond's Systematic Theology. And I wanted to find that uh, quote here, rigidity, there it is. Um, and yeah, okay, uh, here we go. He uh, listed of objections uh, that people have uh, leveled against uh, justification by faith alone uh, through the centuries as this precious truth has come up uh, again and again in church history and has required defense as it's been confused, uh, forgotten, ignored, uh, recovered, celebrated, and everything else that's gone on with it. Um, and he goes through a bunch of uh, objections. Most of them are actually, um, addr actually addressed in uh, scripture itself. And, uh, but he also goes into a historical argument. This is the one I wanted to read, and then I'm going to go through Galatians chapter 5, the first few verses here. Okay, here's the last objection to the gospel, to justification by faith alone. He says, finally, the Protestant doctrine calls into question the salvation of millions of Christians throughout history. This argument made in our time is made in our time even by some Protestants against a rigid application of Protestantism's doctrine of justification by faith alone, contends that if God justifies only those who self-consciously renounce all reliance upon any and all works of righteousness which they have done or will ever do and trust in Christ's vicarious cross work alone, then one must conclude that the vast majority of professing Christians throughout history were not and are not saved. This vast group would include, we are informed, such church fathers as Athanasius, Augustine, Anselm, and Aquinas, who as sacerdotalists, that would be people who believe that, that uh, saving grace comes through sacraments and through priests, as they were sacerdotalists, believed in baptismal regeneration, and because they confused justification and sanctification, believed also in the necessity of deeds of penance for salvation. Against this Protestant rigidity, it is urged that just as God predestinates by grace alone Arminians who have a faulty understanding of the doctrine of election, so too he justifies by faith alone Roman Catholics, among others, who under, whose understanding of justification differs, that is, it does not affirm justification by faith alone, from classic Protestantism's doctrine of justification. Now, <laughs> that's a that's a, a lot, and uh, listen to his response. This argument, however, is aimed not so much at Protestantism's rigidity as it's aimed at Paul's insistence, one, that there's only one gospel, justification by faith alone and Christ's work alone, Romans 3, 27 and 28, Romans 4, 5, Romans 10, 4, Galatians 2, 16, Galatians 3, 10 and 11, Galatians 3, 26, Philippians 3, 8 through 9. Two, that any other gospel is not the gospel. Three, that those who teach any other gospel stand under the anathema of God, Galatians 1, 8 through 9. Four, that those who rely to any degree on their own works for their salvation nullify the grace of God, Romans 11, 5 and 6, make void the cross work of Christ, Galatians 2, 21 and Galatians 5, 2, become debtors to keep the entire law, Galatians 5, 3, and in becoming such, fall from grace, Galatians 5, 4, that is, place themselves again under the curse of the law. As for the four church fathers named above, and many others like them, it is neither my nor their defender's place to assure the Christian world that 
God surely justified them by faith alone, even though they themselves did not hold to a sola fide view of justification. To judge an individual's salvation is God's province and his alone. Therefore, I will not speculate one way or the other about their salvation. But I will say that our attitude should be with Paul ever, quote, let God's truth be inviolate, though every man becomes thereby a liar, Romans 3, 4. What I mean by this is, excuse me, what I mean by this in the present context is that the clear teaching of the word of God should be upheld and we should not look for reasons to avoid it, even if the alternative would force us to conclude that these fathers and all others like them were not saved. So our commitment is to be to scripture, to the word of God alone. And uh, howdy there, everybody. We've got 11 people watching total. And uh, there's Jonas and Paul Garvey. And there's uh, my Lily B there at home. Okay, so Galatians chapter 5. And Lily will remember this because we just went over this last night at church. Galatians chapter 5. Here, Paul kind of summarizing everything that's come before. Obviously, Galatians is a profoundly important letter of, of God's holy word. Galatians 5, 1, stand fast, says Paul, by the Holy Spirit here, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Now, that is God's counsel, <clears throat> his instruction, <clears throat> excuse me, and his command to every professing Christian in the world. Do not let people add anything to faith in Christ as the means of justification before God. Do not let anyone add anything to the essence of what faith is, like works or obedience. Don't let anyone change faith into obedience. Don't let anyone say that, well, yeah, we believe in justification by faith alone, but that's not what gives you a legal title for heaven. You have to do good works and then you're finally saved by your good works. There's all sorts of ways to duplicate the Galatian error. And uh, our age, just like every other age, uh, has come up with um, really nothing creative. It's just uh, rehashings of the same old stuff. But what's our response to that supposed to be? You stand fast in the freedom, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. You see, that's something the unregenerate man, that's something that the new perspectives on Paul, the federal vision heretics, and all the rest of them, they just don't get it. They just don't get it. How could you really produce holiness by setting people free they think to produce holiness you've got to make obedience the obedience of the christian the thing that's definitional to what saves them oh no no, no. it's it's christ christ does his thing christ does does it all but but faith is good works or faith includes obedience no it doesn't faith isn't good works and faith doesn't include obedience ever Faith is the opposite of obedience, to the one not working but believing. His faith is reckoned as righteousness, Paul says in Romans 4, 4 and 5. So no matter how you hear it, whether people include good works into their definition of faith so they can they can say, well, I believe everything that Paul says. Yeah, it's faith apart from works. Well, what do you think faith is? Obedience. Well, what? Yeah, faith, faith includes works. Faith is works. No, it's not. What isn't? Okay, it's vitally important that you get this. What is faith? Faith is personal trust. It's, it's personal trust in Jesus Christ. That's what saving faith is. It is accompanied by, and it is the byproduct of a changed heart, a changed heart. Uh, but saving faith is not good works. Saving faith is not obedience. It doesn't include good works, and it doesn't include obedience. It bears the fruit of good works, bears the fruit of obedience, but that's not what saving faith is ever so if people start smudging the line between faith and works faith and obedience that's being entangled again with a yoke of bondage okay um yeah lily that's a <laughs> that's a good question why would paul say faith apart from works if faith if faith is works is that what you meant to say, sweetie? If faith is works, um, yeah, good, uh, good question. That's a question I've asked many Federal Vision heretics and their supporters. If faith is works, why does Paul say constantly we're justified by faith without works, apart from works, not by works, not by law, not by works of law? 
doesn't make any sense. Well, it's because those that um, are the enemies of the gospel who, who are inside the church and get in pulpits every Sunday, uh, they don't care about um, being faithful to the word of God. They just want to bring people into bondage. Okay, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty and the freedom by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I know nothing that I ever do or have done or will do can save me or can contribute to getting me into heaven. I know that. And yet I have a very strong desire to live a godly life and to be holy. I know the unregenerate man just cannot understand that. Well, if you don't obligate people to save themselves by their good works, they'll, they'll, they'll never do good works. Yeah, I know you, you think that, but that's not true. Because when God changes the heart of one of his elect people and effectually calls them, he implants that hunger, that desire to walk in obedience. But that person will never trust in their obedience, nor will they ever think that their obedience is part of their definition of saving faith either. Never. And then Paul moves into an even stronger statement in verse 2. He just gets stronger and stronger here. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. What, what does he mean by this? He's saying here, the Holy Spirit is saying to the world, if you try to mix faith with works in any way, Christ will be of no benefit to you. You can say you believe in Jesus, but if you try to fold works or obedience into your definition of saving faith, you are clearly saying that what Christ did is not sufficient. You're clearly saying that what Jesus Christ did is not enough to save you. And that's why he says, if you get circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Because if these people get circumcised as a means of being justified by God, if they really do believe that being circumcised is going to make them right with God, what are they saying about faith in Christ then? What are they saying about what Jesus did? It clearly is not enough. If you're doing something that you think saves you, you clearly don't think that what Jesus did by itself is sufficient. Isn't that so clear? Paul says back in Galatians 2.21, I do not nullify the grace of God. If righteousness, if justification comes through the law, if it comes through what we do, then Christ died for nothing. Then Christ died in vain. KB good. Uh, I thought faith is a gift from God. No, it is a gift from God. Yeah, it's a gift from God. And faith is personal trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It receives and rests upon Jesus Christ alone. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not sure why you're asking me that, but that, that's okay. It is a gift of God. It's a sovereign gift of God given only to his elect people. And it's something that God does in the hearts of his people. And when he draws them to Jesus Christ, he grants them faith in Christ so that they trust in him. Um, what are you confused about? KB good. What are you, what are you confused about there? I thought faith was a gift from God. It is a gift from God. But I, I have the gift of faith. What is faith? It's personal trust in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> in other words, I'm not relying upon anything that I do to get me into heaven. I am relying upon and trusting only in the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to me and in his cross work received by God the Father as the full justice satisfying payment for all my sins. That's what... That's what faith is. Faith looks away from self, away from works, away from anything that, that is wrought in us or done by us and rests upon the finished work and the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. I thought you printed faith is works. Are you serious? <laughs> um, I have said billions of times, faith is not works. Faith is not works. Faith is reliance upon Jesus Christ. Works is stuff that we do. We're justified by faith in Christ, not by anything that we do, ever, to any degree at all. Okay, when we say faith is a gift from God, it's a result of the regeneration and giving of a new heart to the believer. Exactly, exactly right. It's exactly right. Um, faith is, is the byproduct of that new heart. It, it is the, the regenerate heart immediately believes in Jesus Christ, immediately believes the gospel. Once God takes that heart of stone out and puts in a heart of flesh, 
um, then that the first thing that person does is they they see their sin and they hate their sin, they turn from their sin, and they trust in Christ alone. They will immediately recognize I am not only in danger, but I hate the sin that, that I still see in me now. Okay, so Paul's saying there, if you get circumcised, if you add anything to the finished work of Christ, if you think that what you're doing, even if you attribute it all to grace and to the Lord Jesus, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. As soon as you are consciously relying to any degree on what you do, Christ will be of no benefit to you because you clearly don't understand that it's Christ alone that saves. It's his work alone that saves. Faith doesn't do anything. I saw someone forwarded me a horrible article by Doug Wilson. Um, and the, the article's title was Saving Faith is a Busy Bee. And, and I just, about faith does works and faith works, 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 works. I pointed out the article's mistitled. The article should be called Christians are busy bees. Faith doesn't do anything. Faith rests on Christ's work. Christians do all kinds of things. Christians bear those fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Yes, th those are the fruits of God's work in a person's life. They are not what save us. They can't be what save us. Okay, then in verse 3 of Galatians 5. He makes it even stronger, and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised, because, because if they become circumcised, they're clearly consciously trusting in that work to save them. If you become circumcised, you are a debtor to keep the whole law. And what's he saying there? If you take one step in the direction of works righteousness and add that to faith in Christ as the means of getting into heaven, then Christ will be of no benefit to you, and you get to keep the whole, the whole law all by yourself. And Paul's thinking there's only two roads. There's you save yourself by your good works, which will never work because no one can do that, or you put your faith in Christ alone. Oh, wait, well, what, what about if you believe it's Jesus plus works? Then Christ will be of no benefit to you, and you get to keep the whole law by yourself. I always think, and I mentioned this to the to the class that was there last night, Matthew 7, 22, Jesus said, many will come on that day. Many will come on that day thinking they're going to go to heaven because I we, we believed in Jesus. But then they added stuff to him. And if you add stuff to Jesus, what does Paul say here? Christ will profit you nothing. Jesus will profit you nothing. He won't save you then. To come to God means you come on his terms. What are his terms? You self-consciously, consciously renounce your trust in anything that you do. And you trust only in the finished work of Christ. That's not me being a rock-ribbed Protestant. That's not me being rigid. That's what the Holy Spirit says. And whether more or less people like that or rejoice in it, doesn't matter. I think that there are many, many, many professing Christians today who really don't understand just how narrow the true gospel really is. They don't understand how narrow that gate really is. You can't bring anything through the gate with you. It's Christ alone, nothing else. The Holy Spirit echoes across the ages. I, Paul, say to you, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. So if you want to go to heaven, you want to not end up in hell, you can't rely upon anything that you're doing, and you can't include works or obedience into your definition of saving faith. You can't. You can't. And if you try to do that, there's the text, Christ will profit you nothing. If you think faith is obedience to God, Christ will profit you nothing. And you're a debtor to keep the whole law. Verse 4, you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law, you who attempt to get into heaven by your fruit, by your good works. You have fallen from grace. It's, it's very clear, very simple, very, very powerful. 
stuff there. Okay, uh, let me just see who's over here in the in the little chat channel here, real quick. How's it going? Maybe never get the sick of sound doctrine. Thank you. Yes, um, I love to hear sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is is everything, and um, been reading some good stuff lately. Um, been reading some good theology, and uh, been reading uh, Louis Burkhoff again. I've been reading Robert Raymond some. I've been reading. Um, uh, Wilhelm of Brockles, A Christian's uh, Reasonable Service. It's such a great book. I mean, it's good, solid, sound theology. And uh, um, there's other books laying around here I've been trying to read. Um, just finished my morning sermon. I'm preaching on the perseverance of the saints. Um, and I've, I've done this. Uh, it's actually the fourth sermon in a series I've been doing on the Synod of Dort. And uh, I've been learning uh, more about that. I've, I've reread the Cans of Dort again and uh, been reading uh, Robert Godfrey's book, Saving the Reformation, and also uh, Daniel Hyde's book, Grace Worth Fighting For. And I'll tell you, uh, we really need a return to that. We need we need a return to clear, clear uh, proclamation of the doctrines of grace, of God's sovereign grace. Okay. Uh, when we say faith is a gift from God, it's a result of their generation. Yeah, that's right. I already read that one. Um, I think people get their own will and faith confused. Yeah, that's, they, they do. Because... Um, we always have wills that human beings always have wills and we live by our will and our act and we act by, by our wills. The problem is before we're born again, before we are regenerated, the will of man is enslaved to sin and cannot, um, believe and cannot repent either. What's the relationship between the gate being narrow and hard to get in yet forsaking all your good works and trusting in Christ is the most freeing and light burden one can ever be involved in. Um, well, the, the way that leads to life is, is hard, um, uh, because you're going to have lots of opposition and it's a, it's a difficult path. You're going to have persecution. If, if you're faithful to the truth, if you actually love and stand for what's true, you will have a lot of opposition. And so it's hard. Um, but the, the grace of God is free. It's free grace. It's a free gift and it's ours for, uh, the receiving. We simply receive and rest on Christ alone. Um, and that's going to be accompanied by uh, repentance uh, unto life, uh, which means that God changes that heart and, and causes us to despise our sins and causes us uh, to begin the steps of, of new obedience. Um, and yeah, Jesus's burden is light, um, meaning it's not the iron yoke of Pharisaism. It's not the legalistic um, a huge pile of commandments that the Pharisees uh, had made up and added to the law of God to make people um, slaves to. Uh, Christ's burden is light. He's the one who gives us rest for our souls. It's kind of like, just like Christian in the Pilgrim's Progress, when he finally gets to the cross and has salvation, that burden falls off of his back. Okay, the burden falls off of his back and he takes the yoke of Christ and it's a much lighter yoke and Jesus is always gonna be with him. But then he sets on the path, living the Christian life. That's the hard part. <laughs> getting saved when God changes the heart and effectually calls us and unites us to Christ. That's easy. That's the easy part. God does that in us. It's living as a Christian in the world for the rest of our natural lives. That's the hard part. That's the struggle. Okay. Grace is free and salvation is free. Christian life is a war. Okay. We're not, at, we're not at war to try to save ourselves. Jesus already did that for us. Jesus has accomplished that for us. What the hard part is, constantly being embattled against our own sin and, and dealing with apostasy in the church and dealing with the rise of false teachers and the rise of, of wicked people in the church and dealing with all that kind of stuff. That's the hard thing. Okay. How do you read through systematics? Would A.A. Hodges Westminster commentary be a good place to start with systematic theology? Um, A.A. Hodge, if, if, you're, if you're not someone who's read a whole lot of theology, Hodge might be a little bit harder um, if you're new to systematic theology, I would recommend that you, in fact, I'm going to step away just one second and show you something. Here, this. Confessing Christ by Calvin Knox Cummings. This is a great little introduction. It's a, a study of the Christian faith from a biblical reformed perspective. This is one of the best little books you could ever read, to read to your kids, to read to a new Christian. It's wonderful little book. And I would also recommend before you, you start reading one of the larger works, 
Um, read through the Shorter Catechism, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, or here. I always keep stacks of these bad boys. In fact, I just gave one of these to a fellow that uh, called the church, and I met him for coffee down in Johnson City yesterday and gave him one of these. Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms uh, with the scripture proofs, with proof texts. Um, great resource. In fact, that was one of the things I did right out of the gate when I first uh, was introduced to Reformed Theology. I got a copy of the Westminster Confession, and I just read it over and over and over and over and over again. Um, but this is great because it has the scripture proofs in it, and I would encourage you, um, you want to understand systematic theology like the basic rudiments of biblical doctrine, the, Sh the Westminster Shorter Catechism is one of the best places that, to start. It's one of the best things that you could ever do is memorize that Westminster Shorter Catechism. Uh, my, my four oldest kids, you know, recited the whole thing from memory, uh, all 107 uh, answers from memory. And I'm working with my my next little batch of kids there, uh, Lily, Hannah, Malachi, and some of the other ones, are, are they listen in while we're working on it. But the goal is to get them all the way through it so they know the entire Westminster Shorter Catechism. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I mean, you think of the, the questions. What is man's chief end? In other words, why does man exist? Man, man's chief end, he exists uh, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. What rule has God given to direct us? How we may glorify and enjoy him. The word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. And then question three, what do the scriptures principally teach? Two things. The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. And then question four through, I believe it's 38 is what man's supposed to believe about God, and that's the doctrine of God and the incarnation, the fall of man, the covenant of works, covenant of grace, justification, sanctification, all that good stuff. And then you get into the duty God requires of man, which is obedience to God's commandments. You get an exposition of the law, the Ten Commandments, an exposition of the Lord's Prayer. How are we to pray? And so you want to understand systematic theology? Systematic theology in its finest expression in all of church history is right there. Westminster Confession of Faith and the Shorter and Larger Catechisms. I've used uh, my, my copy of this is uh, is all falling apart. These are actually really nice when they're brand new. Mine's old and falling apart, and I keep it uh, with me in my gym bag, and I keep it uh, around my bed. It's over. Actually, it's, it's at home on my piano right now. But I've used it for devotions. I use it for family worship. Um, it's wonderful stuff. Uh, the sy systematic theology of the confession. Then I would encourage you, after you've gone through it a bunch of times, then read A. A. Hodge. Um, his commentary on the um, on the Westminster Confession is great. G. I. Williamson is another one. A, a study of the of the Westminster Confession is fantastic. Um, and that, let's see, as far as systematic theology, um, <clears throat> a manual of Christian doctrine by Lewis Burkhoff is a great, great, great book. His systematic, that's like the abridged version of Burkhoff's systematic theology. Burkhoff's systematic theology is uh, is a very large work, but it's one of the best ever. I mean, is there a better reformed systematic theology than Burkhoff? I mean, seriously, he is wonderful. I love Louis Burkhoff. I mean, he's one of my favorite people to read. In fact, I have a book by him on assurance, uh, and it's fantastic. Burkhoff was an excellent writer. Yes, David Dixon's... Um, it's, it's called um, Truth's Victory Over Error, Aaron, is what it's called on there. Um, yeah, I, I was actually going to recommend that one, too. David Dixon, Truth's Victory Over Error. Uh, what, that, what that one shows you is um, all the different uh, errors that are addressed in the Westminster Confession, all the different heresies that they address and uh, reject. They don't spell out all the history of that, but Dixon kind of helps you see uh, what they're addressing. I'll put that title, Truths, Victory Over Error on the Westminster Confession of Faith. So David Dixon is good. So Hodge, A.A. Hodge's um, commentary on the confession. Commentary on the, on the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, I would also recommend, um, uh, what was the other one? Oh, yeah, Lewis... Burkhoff's um, Manual of Christian Doctrine. That's like the abridged version of his systematic theology. And uh, and also, as always, Robert L. Raymond, his A New Systematic Theology of the Christian Faith, which uh, the second edition is out now. 
Uh, and I have a, actually I have a bunch of those in there. And if I know someone will read it, I'll, I'll just give it to them because it's just so excellent. Okay, so there you have uh, just those first few verses of Galatians 5. I've actually got a couple of errands I need to run. I got to take a couple of my kiddos uh, to track. And then I've got some more um, sermon preparation work I need to do. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I'm just going to wrap it up there. Unless someone has got uh, some more questions. Let's see. I've been reading through the confessions daily along with truth over error. Yeah, that's good. That's a good combination. David Dixon's book, Truth's Victory Over Error, is fantastic. And uh, the, read the Westminster Standards. Read Calvin Knox Cummings' little book. Um, I'll put that on here. Calvin Knox Cummings. you got to love that guy's name. Calvin Knox Cummings. <laughs> um, it's called Confessing. Let's see. Confessing Christ is a great little book. I believe Great Commission Publications prints those. Yeah. And I have a stack of those over there, too, because that's a great, great, great book. Great resource. Okie dokie. Uh, good, good program today. I appreciate y'all. Um, and three. All right. So I hope y'all have a good uh, rest of your week. Have a good Lord's Day. And uh, we'll see you uh, hopefully sometime earlier next week. I'm going to try to start doing a few more programs. But thank y'all for watching or for listening.